Hello my friends, welcome back to Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours. Today I'm on my way to meet my friend Felipe, who did my intro music for me, and we are going to the Oatman family massacre that occurred in 1851 near Sentinel, Arizona, about 50 miles from Yuma, Arizona. Stay with me on this adventure, my friends. My friend Felipe over here, the man that did my intro music, and we are on our way to a very famous massacre site from 1851, the Oatman family massacre. They were attacked by Indians and almost all slaughtered as they lay out here near Sentinel, Arizona, and we are on our way, and I'm going to show you the grave site for the Oatman family. Stay with me, my friends. Big Bill Anderson here, my friends. Finally, Felipe and I have found the Oatman family grave from the massacre that occurred in 1851 by the Yavapai Indians, where the, most of the family was slaughtered. We're gonna go to the massacre site also, but this is where they were originally laid to rest. Stay with me, my friends. I'm going to tell you the whole story about this very famous massacre site and the graves of the Oatman family. Stay with me. Okay, my friends. So the grave site where the Oatmans were buried is right out there where my finger, the tip of my finger is where I'm pointing. And they came right down through this valley and tried to come up this trail. Well, actually they did make it up this mountainous rocky trail in 1851, 170 years ago, which is just absolutely amazing. 171 to be precise. They came up this rocky incline from down there and they made it all the way to the top here. And Right over there, where my finger is pointing, right there, is the massacre site right here where the Yavapai Indians waited for them, the Oatmans, to reach the top of this plateau and where they were all attacked and many were slaughtered. And I'm gonna tell you uh, the rest of this story and, and finish it off. It's pretty interesting, my friends. So stay with me, thank you. In 1850, the Oatman family joined a wagon train led by James C. Brewster, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose disagreements with the church leadership in Salt Lake City, Utah, had caused him to break away with the followers of Brigham Young in Utah and lead his followers, named the Brewsterites, to California, which he claimed was the intended place of gathering for the Mormons. The Brewsterite immigrants, numbering around 90, departed Independence, Missouri on August 5, 1850. Dissension caused the group to split near Santa Fe in New Mexico territory, with Brewster following the northern route. Royce Oatman and several other families chose the southern route via Socorro and Tucson. Near Socorro, Royce Oatman assumed command of the party. They reached New Mexico Territory early in 1851, only to find the country and climate wholly unsuited to their purpose. The other wagons gradually abandoned the goal of reaching the mouth of the Colorado River. They were told that not only was the stretch of trail ahead, 
barren and dangerous, but that the Native Americans ahead were very hostile and they would risk their lives if they proceeded further. The other families resolved to stay. The Oatman family, eventually traveling alone, was nearly annihilated in what became known as the Oatman Massacre on the banks of the Gila River, about 90 miles east of Yuma in what is now Arizona. Marianne and Royce Oatman had seven children. Marianne was also pregnant with their eighth child during their journey from Illinois to the Gila River. The Oatman children ranged in age from 17 years old to one year old, with Lucy Oatman being the oldest. And had been looking for her and Mary Ann. Their meeting made headline news across the West. Five years after the attack, she was repatriated into American society. The story of the Oatman massacre began to be retold with dramatic license in the press as well as in her own memoir and speeches. Novels, plays, movies, and poetry were inspired, which resonated in the media of the time and long afterward. She had become an oddity in the 1860s America, partly owing to the prominent blue tattooing of her face by the Mojave, making her the first known white woman with native tattoo on her on the Oatman's fourth day out from Maricopa Wells, after making the difficult climb with their oxen and wagon up the steep grade of a plateau with large rocks hindering the ascent, they were approached by a group of Native Americans, later identified from the Yavapai tribe who were asking for tobacco and food. Due to the lack of supplies, Royce Oatman was hesitant to share too much with a small group of Yavapais. They became irate at his stinginess. During the encounter, the Yavapais attacked the Oatman family, clubbing several to death. All were killed except for three of the children, Lorenzo, age 15, who was left for dead, Olive, age 14, and Marianne, age 7, who were taken to be slaves for the Yavapais. The Native Americans took some of the Oatman family's belongings, along with Olive and Marianne, to a village eight miles southwest of Aguila, Arizona, in the Harquahela Mountains. After the attack, Lorenzo awoke to find his parents and siblings dead, but he saw no sign of little Marianne and Olive. Lorenzo attempted the hazardous trek to find help. He finally reached a settlement where his wounds were treated. Three days later, he returned to the bodies of his slain family. In a detailed retelling, which was reprinted in newspapers over the decades, he said, We buried the bodies in one common grave. The men had no way of digging proper graves in the volcanic, rocky soil. So they gathered the bodies together and laid a huge mound of rocks over them. It has been said that the remains were reburied several times and finally moved to the river just below the plateau where the family was attacked for reinterment by early Arizona colonizer Charles Poston. Lorenzo Oatman became a determined to never give up on his search for his only surviving siblings. After arriving at the village, the girls were initially treated in a way that appeared threatening, and Olive later said she thought they would be killed. However, the girls were used as slaves to forage for food, to lug water and firewood, and for other menial tasks. They were frequently beaten. After the girls lived with the Yavapais for a year, the Mojave Indian tribe came to trade for the girls. While Lorenzo exhaustively attempted to recruit governmental help in searching for them, Marianne died from starvation, and Olive spent four years living with the Mojave Indians. When Olive was 19 years old, Francisco, a Yuma Indian messenger, arrived at the village with a message from authorities at Fort Yuma. Rumors suggested that a white girl was living with the Mojaves, and the post commander requested her return. At first, they denied that Olive was even white. Over the course of negotiations, some expressed their affection for Olive, 
others their fear of reprisal from the whites. Trade items were included in such as blankets and a white horse. And he passed on the threats that the whites would destroy the Mojaves if they did not release Olive. After some discussion, the Mojaves decided to accept those terms and Olive was escorted to Fort Yuma in a 20-day journey. Olive was given Western clothing lent by the wife of an army officer as she was clad in a traditional Mojave skirt with no covering above her waist. Inside the fort, Olive was surrounded by cheering people. Within a few days of her arrival at the fort, Olive discovered that her brother Lorenzo was alive and had been looking for her and Mary Ann. Their meeting made headline news across the West. Five years after the attack, she was repatriated into American society. The story of the Oatman massacre began to be retold with dramatic license in the press, as well as in her own memoir and speeches. Novels, plays, movies, and poetry were inspired, which resonated in the media of the time and long afterward. She had become an oddity in the 1860s America, partly owing to the prominent blue tattooing of her face by the Mojave tribe making her the first known white woman with native tattooing on record. Much of, what, much of what actually occurred during her time with the Native Americans remains unknown. Olive later spoke with fondness of the Mojaves, who she said treated her better than her first captors. She most likely considered herself assimilated into the tribe. In 1857, a pastor named Royal B. Stratton sought out Olive and Lorenzo Oatman. He co-wrote a book about the Oatman massacre and the girls' captivity titled Life Among the Indians. It was a bestseller for that era at 30,000 copies. Royalties for the book paid for Olive and her brother Lorenzo to attend the University of the Pacific. Olive, Olive and Lorenzo accompanied Stratton across the country on a book tour, promoting the book and lecturing in various circuits. Olive was a curiosity. Her boldly tattooed chin was on display, and people came to hear her story and witness the blue tattoo for themselves. She was the first known tattooed American woman, as well as one of the first female public speakers. Olive entered the lecture circuit as feminism was developing. In November of 1865, Olive Oatman married a cattleman named John B. Fairchild. She moved with Fairchild to Sherman, Texas. Her husband died in 1877. Her brother Lorenzo died on October 8, 1901. Olive Oatman Fairchild died of a heart attack on March 20th, 1903 at the age of 65. She is buried at the West Hill Cemetery in Sherman, Texas. I was very excited to go to this historic location. It really depicts how tough settlers had it trying to expand westward and battling the elements of life as well as the Native Americans. So my friends, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends. Subscribe to my channel if you have not done so as of yet. Big Bill Anderson's Death Tours has a lot more to offer, my friends, just down the road. And I thank each and every one of you for the growth that I have sustained through the months of challenges here with this COVID happening across the country and the world. Really does impede progress on my channel, not on everyone's channel, but it has on mine. So, my friends, please bear with me as we grow and I thank each and every one of you once again. Adios, amigos.